up in webheads, it's me MT and this is a breakdown of Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man film from the year 2002 featuring the first appearance of Tobey Maguire as the spectacular Spider-Man himself. I'm going to break down all the easter eggs that you may have missed after all of the times that you have rewatched this classic of a Marvel film. So throw on your underoos because we're about to spider dive into it. And right before the movie even starts, a piece of cinematic history has already been made as Spider-Man 1 would be the first ever Marvel movie with the comic book flipping pages Marvel intro, an intro that would show at the start of every Marvel film until Marvel Studios revamped their logo for 2013's Thor The Dark World after becoming a more independent entity under Disney. Spider-Man 1 would also make cinematic history by becoming the first movie in history to make over $100 million on its opening weekend, with the movie actually earning a whopping $114.8 million in that weekend, firmly cementing the superhero genre as a lucrative one after after studios were slowly starting to have faith in them again following the successes of both Blade and X-Men 1. And you can definitely tell that this Spider-Man movie came two years after the first X-Men film when the movie opens with an animated credit sequence traveling down the strings of a spiderweb, in the same way that X-Men 1 had opening credits travel through animated DNA strands. And during this red and blue opening sequence, the statue birds on the Chrysler building can be seen, foreshadowing Spider-Man sitting on these eagles to grieve the loss of Uncle Ben later on in the film. McGuire's Spider-Man would, of course, later reveal that the Chrysler Building was his favorite spot to look over all of New York City in Spider-Man No Way Home. And if you consider how the designers of the Chrysler Building itself purposely put those eagle heads there to symbolize the theme of taking flight, having Peter Parker grieve over the loss of Uncle Ben on one of these eagles before he takes flight himself as Spider-Man was deeply intentional and symbolic in my opinion. But anyways, as the movie opens up with the Midtown High school bus, we can see actor Joe Manganiello as Peter Parker. Parker's high school bully, Flash Thompson, in his first ever superhero movie appearance. You know, before appearing as the iconic Deathstroke in the post credit scene to DC's Justice League that went absolutely nowhere. My favorite. Honestly, put him in Peacemaker Season 2, I say. It's a perfect fit. But fun fact, Joe Manganiello didn't actually initially audition for the role of Flash, but for the role of Spider-Man instead. But Manganiello quickly realized that he was much too physically big for the role of Spider-Man, and that it'd be super awkward to see someone his size get picked on, and I School. Harry Osborn actor James Franco also auditioned for the role of Spider-Man, but was given the role of Harry Osborn when they saw how convincing him and Willem Dafoe played as father and son. And soon after, if you look closely as the school bus is in motion, you can see what appears to be a 26-year-old man running after said school bus. Now, according to several interviews with director Sam Raimi, this is actually a 17-year-old boy named Peter Parker and not some strange man looking to groom his way back to the prom. I honestly don't even blame the bus driver for not stopping for this grown ass man. I'm just kidding. But Tobey Maguire really was 26 years old during the filming of this movie, with Kirsten Dunst being a whole seven years younger than him at the age of 19, which is kind of weird. Like, Kirsten Dunst is the only member of that main cast that is actually a teenager, as Joe Manganiello was 24 and James Franco was 23. Not sure why they didn't just cast kids, because this entire school just looks like a bunch of super dumb adults who've had to repeat senior year at least five times. But you know what? Calculus is hard. I get it. But anyways, when Harry introduces Peter to his father during their field trip, we learn that this version of Norman Osborn was something of a nanoscientist himself, much like Tony Stark and Shuri are in the MCU. Osborn's work with nanotechnology was actually considered some pretty breakthrough science that impressed a bunch of scientists in that universe, especially Otto Octavius, who seemed to very lightly hint at his admiration at Norman Osborn's influential work with nanotechnology in Spider-Man No Way Home when he calls Norman a brilliant scientist scientist and tells Peter that he outdid himself with his nanotech suit. Since Octavius was familiar with Peter's academic prowess and Peter did write a paper about Norman's nanotech findings in high school, Octavius likely figured that Tom Holland's Spider-Man replicated Osborne's work when he mistook him for Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. But anyways, as Peter's class is led through the science lab at Columbia University, the tour guide explains the origin of the spider that would inevitably bite Peter Parker. Apparently, this lab was working on combining the DNA DNAs of three different types of spiders to create a new, stronger breed of super spider. With those spiders being the Delana spider, which gives Spider-Man his super speed and high jumping capabilities, the funnel web spider, which gave Peter his ultra strong webbing and super strength, 
and the what the fuck is this word, and the Agalenidae spider responsible for Spider-Man's spider sense and speedy reflexes. Though the Delana spider doesn't actually exist in real life, the Delana spider does. So it would appear that someone on set may have made a tiny super spider sized boo-boo of a typo. No big deal. The good thing is, only weirdos like me would notice. But anyways, all three of these spiders led to the creation of the red and blue spider that gave Peter Parker his spider powers. Which is half of the reason why Peter decides to create his red and blue Spider-Man suit. With a later montage revealing that MJ's red hair and blue eyes were also a main inspiration for his color choices. Which I thought was a very nice choice by director Sam Raimi. I also really enjoy how they had Peter wearing a red and blue shirt for this field trip to foreshadow his coming transformation into Spider-Man. But anyways, during the following scene at Oscorp, we learn that the United States military is deeply interested in the development of super soldiers, very much hinting at the past influence and existence of Captain America in this universe, despite this being a Sony project. A newspaper article that Norman looks at later on in the film even references the term super soldier in it when referencing Oscorp's work with superhuman testing. This newspaper article actually reveals a lot of important information about Norman Osborn and his history with Oscorp. Information like how Osborn graduated from MIT at the age of 18 before founding Oscorp around 1966 under the name of Osborn Manufacturing, initially producing industrial equipment before transitioning into the defense contracting business in the mid-70s. And to keep his company from going bankrupt early on, he had to mortgage his house and borrow money from basically everybody that he knew. So you can see why this dude was pretty pissed off when the board of directors would inevitably steal Oscorp away from him later on in the movie. It also mentions how Norman was very much the young super genius that he saw Peter Parker as, as Norman's thesis at MIT basically predicted the miniaturization of computers long before the concept of nanotech was even thought possible. Because of this, in over 250 science papers that he's published since, Norman Osborn's intelligence has become universally respected, giving Norman the reputation as one of the pioneers of nanotechnology as well as one of the smartest men in the world. However, this newspaper article also goes into a lot of negative things about Norman's personality, describing Norman as arrogant, ruthlessly ambitious, having a notable lack of diplomacy, and a history of sacrificing those who have been loyal to him. Which is, of course, what Norman Osborn eventually does to Dr. Mendel Strum immediately after the Goblin Serum altered his brain chemistry. The article also mentions that Norman Osborn was married to an artist by the name of Caroline Mulder, the biological mother of Harry Osborn in this universe, but got divorced after 10 years of a strained and unhappy marriage. A divorce that Norman slightly references to Harry when he insults Harry's girlfriend, MJ, during the dinner scene. Norman very likely saw a lot of his ex-wife Caroline inside of MJ as both of these women were both artists. And Norman didn't want his disappointment of a son to willingly repeat his own mistakes. In the comics, however, Harry Osborn's mother is actually a woman by the name of Emily Lyman, a woman who was so scared of Norman Osborn that she decided to fake her own death to make it look like Harry's birth killed her because she knew that Harry would have plenty of money for therapy. Lots and lots of therapy. We also learn that Norman Osborn secured the favor of a former Secretary of Defense by the name of Michael Innes, the man that General Slocum refers to as his predecessor that used to provide Norman Osborn with his government funding freely before things may have had a slight shift in American politics. However, the most interesting and very easily missed piece of information from this article comes in the form of casually dropping the ingredients to Norman's secret Krabby Patty Goblin formula, specifically when the article notes that in the aim of increasing the user's strength and endurance, reflexes, and mental acuity, Oscorp's super soldier program utilized cutting edge advances in both chemistry and microcomputer technology, basically confirming the presence of nanobots swimming around the vapors of the green goblin gas. Do you know what this means? This implies that much like the brain of Dr. Octavius was partly hijacked by his four metal arms in Spider-Man 2, the mind of Norman Osborn might have been altered accidentally by these nanobots, amplifying the worst parts of his personality and creating a whole new alternate consciousness to house these amplified aspects in the form of the Green Goblin persona. Like that is kind of a major Green Goblin fact hidden in plain sight here. And I'm kind of surprised that people don't talk about nanotech's influence on the Goblin serum more often. It seems like a serum in two parts, with the chemistry 
altering the physical body and giving the user stronger muscles, and the nanobots amplifying mental acuity, but sometimes unfortunately altering brain chemistry. The serum was of course made partly due to the efforts of Norman's right-hand man, Dr. Mendel Strum, who in the comics was actually the inventor of the Green Goblin serum, and after a series of unfortunate events courtesy of Norman Osborn, developed a severe hatred for both Norman and Spider-Man that eventually led him into becoming the cyborg supervillain Robot Master after briefly going by the name Gaunt. But Robot Master sounds a lot cooler. What the hell's a Gaunt? I don't know what that is. Anyways, moving on, when Peter gets home from his field trip, on the walls you can see some Revolutionary War era art with what looks like an old timey ship in a New England harbor pictured on the top and the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the bottom, which is fitting considering that Paul Revere was a man with great responsibility. And that's what Uncle Ben is all about. And right before Peter walks in, we learn that Uncle Ben is 68 years old, but Uncle Ben actor Cliff Robertson was actually closer to 79 at the time. But unfortunately, Robert Robertson would pass away a day after his 88th birthday on September 10th, 2011. Aunt May actress Rosemary Harris, however, was around 75 during the filming of this movie and recently celebrated her 96th birthday on September 19th, 2023. We love you, Rosemary. Please live forever. And right before Peter passes out on the floor to go through his spider transformation, you can see the words, The Adventure Begins, on a poster in his bedroom, symbolically pointing to Peter's own adventure beginning. Like, I really enjoy how they have Peter wrap himself in a red and blue cocoon of a blanket to also foreshadow the start of his body's metamorphosis into Spider-Man. And during this transformation, you can see what looks like a tarantula flash on the screen, as well as two skeleton heads, with Peter's skeleton head flashing first, and then a completely random second skeleton head flashing on the side of Peter for some reason. But as the transformation continues after these flashes, you can see an animation of spiders crawling on Peter's neurons to illustrate his spider sense being modified into his body, followed by a very X-Men movie-like journey through Peter's DNA, so we can see it being replaced by his super spider DNA, much like the TV at the Genetic Research Institute showed earlier. And I also really enjoyed how immediately after Spider-Man's transformation, we get the transformation scene for the movie's villain, the Green Goblin, and a hilarious moment from actor Willem Dafoe, who verbally reacts to the coldness of the clamps meant to strap Norman Osborn into place. That line was 100% not in the script whatsoever and was actually Willem Dafoe being surprised by how cold the metal clamp was. And when Norman is being exposed to the goblin gas in the chamber, a computer screen on the side is apparently able to document Norman Osborn's physical transformation data in real time, possibly alluding to the nanobots within the serum itself. Those nanobots swimming within the muscle altering chemicals of the gas seem to be able to track Osborn's strength potential, muscle density, agility, visual acuity, sensory organs, reflexes, synaptic relay performance, healing potential, and bone mass, with the actual stickers on Norman's body monitoring his heart rate through an EKG. But what I found interesting about the transition between the scene and the next is that it appears to hold Peter's very first spider sense experience, as Peter appears to physically wake up as a response to his spider sense warning him about the violent birth of his future arch enemy, the Green Goblin, very much pointing to those precognitive effects that the tour guide at the Spider Genetic Research Institute was talking about. But then, shortly after, we see the results of Peter's muscular metamorphosis when he checks out the super jack spider-man in the mirror a metamorphosis that apparently gave him a bigger penis too which is a plus but you know since peter parker has little to no gain he would unfortunately not be able to test that new penis out until after the end of spider-man 2 yikes but fun fact about these muscles actor toby Maguire actually had to train four hours a day six days a week for five months to achieve this muscular look for the movie as well as to get his body into shape for all the fighting that he'd be doing and he did this in large part due to the fact that initially, when he was being considered for the role, the production was worried that Maguire would not be able to convincingly portray the strength and fighting spirit of Spider-Man, despite testing really well as a perfect Peter Parker. However, when they saw how well Toby did for his screen test as Spider-Man, they knew that Toby had the dedication for both the role 
and the hardcore training regiment that would come with it. But anyways, when new penis Parker is checking out MJ in her bedroom like a creep with spider-enhanced teenage hormones, you can see a picture of Albert Einstein as well as a figurine of a NASA rocket, which showcases Peter's admiration for science geniuses like Norman Osborn and Otto Octavius, as well as his interest in outer space. Peter would end up being so interested in outer space, in fact, that he would eventually end up stealing an astronaut's fiance in Spider-Man 2 before having an alien inserted into his ass in Spider-Man 3. Directly right up there, right up the hole. But anyways, as MJ's argument with her father spills onto the front of her house, we can see Sam Raimi's car parked right outside Peter Parker's house. Continuing the director's now long-standing tradition of placing his beloved 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88 in all of his movies since 1981's The Evil Dead, starring Bruce Campbell, an actor who also appears later on in the film as the announcer for Peter's wrestling match against Randy Savage's Bonesaw. Campbell would go on to make further cameos in the Spider-Man sequels as a theater usher in Spider-Man 2 and a French-sounding waiter in Spider-Man 3, with the reason for this being tied to director Sam Raimi's ambitious Spider-Man 4 plans of revealing Bruce Campbell as famous Spider-Man villain Mysterio, which would have been super dope if Spider-Man 4 actually happened. But anyway, speaking of MJ's strained relationship with her father, this is actually very comic book accurate, as Mary Jane's father, Philip Watson, was extremely abusive to MJ, her sister Gail, and her mother Madeline. And I also feel like MJ's complicated relationship with her father in the comics could also possibly explain why Zendaya's MJ primarily goes by Michelle Jones in the MCU, as her taking the Watson name after all the shitty things that her father has done was likely pretty unacceptable for Zendaya's MJ for a very long time. But it would seem now, these days, that MCU MJ's relationship with her father has healed a little bit since the blip. I mean, sorry to talk about the MCU so early in this Marvel breakdown series, but I figured that Philip Watson detail was fairly significant. But anyways, moving on, when Norman wakes up after his deadly goblin transformation, notice how his office is filled with various masks. This was an intentional choice by the production to give the Norman Osborn character a fascination with masks from different cultures to inspire him to create his horrifying green goblin mask to strike fear in the hearts of anyone who would dare try to fight one of Oscorp's super soldiers. And behind the woman who tells Norman about Dr. Strom's death is a mask that looks a lot like Dr. Doom in my opinion. However, that could very well just be coincidental. But since this is a Marvel film, you never really know. And in the same vein, you can also see what appears to be a white bullseye on a beam to the entrance of the subway as a daily bugle truck drives past Midtown High, possibly a nod to the daredevil villain Bullseye and his signature white bullseye symbol. But again, this could just be a random bullseye that somebody drew on the subway, who knows. I'm just pointing things out that I see. And after this, we see Peter eating his lunch with two cartons of milk like a fucking serial killer <laughs> before getting that impressive spider moment of Peter catching MJ's lunch after she almost slips and falls. And the reason why it's impressive is that Tobey Maguire actually caught all of those falling lunch items, as director Sam Raimi wanted to use real items instead of CGI in order to make it look authentic. And because of this, it took Tobey Maguire 156 takes in order to make that shot happen. My god, that must have been a really stressful day on set. But before we move on, let's take a moment to inspect MJ's outfit. And no, I'm not trying to be the fashion police for a teenager, because, you know, I'm not a creep. <laughs> I just want you guys to notice the flower design on her shirt. Throughout this movie, both MJ and Aunt May are fairly consistently wearing flowers on their clothing, likely to symbolize how precious both of these women are to Peter and how he seeks to take care of them, much like a gardener would take care of their plants. Aunt May's house is also decorated in flower decor for this reason as well, I believe. Very nice and subtle design choice by Sam Raimi here. In the Spider-Man 2 video game, we find out that his version of Aunt May was also obsessed with flowers as well, likely inspired by the Aunt May from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. But anyways, after Peter sends Flash Thompson flying, we can hilariously see a poster on the wall that says, Think Fast, which is perfectly placed in this moment, considering that Flash didn't think fast enough in order to avoid getting beat down by some radioactive virgin. But later on, when Peter is up on the roof trying to squirt his spider wrist juice all over the fine people of New York, Peter references DC Comics superheroes Superman and Shazam when he yells, Up, Up, and Away, Web, and Shazam. Then, during the montage that we get when Peter is trying to nail down the 
the design for his Spider-Man wrestling costume, we can see that Peter was initially thinking of becoming a Black Widow themed super wrestler, as the symbol for the Black Widow spider can be seen on a number of Peter's school book sketches. But one of my favorite spider concepts that Peter draws in his notebook has got to be this black suit Spider-Man with these red eyes and spider symbol, a costume that is apparently also deeply inspired by the black and red Black Widow spider. Marvel Comics would go on to make this Spider-Man suit design canon in the pages of Spider-Man Deadpool number 8, when a darker version of Peter Parker makes himself a fresh new suit to match that new attitude. But then, directly after this, Peter realizes that his suit needs more color and immediately starts thinking about both Mary Jane's red hair and blue eyes and the red and blue theme of the super spider that bit him, causing Peter to be inspired to add red and blue as the core colors of his costume. And right after this, when Peter was attempting to to shoot his goo at a can of Dr. Pepper, we can see that Peter has hung copies of the field trip photographs that he took of Mary Jane right at the top of his desk so that he can see her every time that he works in his room, which is kind of creepy. But hey, at least we know that his heart is in the right place. Still creepy though. But anyways, in the next scene, when Norman Osborn starts reading that extremely informative Daily Bugle news article, the very top of the front page has the words, International Playboy Grant Curtis sued for palimony, which is a reference to one of the movie's producers. Grant Curtis, who was recently an executive producer on the Moon Knight TV series for Marvel Studios. The front page article about Oscorp that Norman looks at here seemingly uses the same wide shot of Oscorp that is used early on in the movie. And after Uncle Ben drops Peter off at the library in Sam Raimi's Easter egg of a car, renowned actress Octavia Spencer can be seen signing Peter in to his wrestling event, which was a detail that I somehow missed before my most recent viewing. And speaking of surprise famous actresses in this movie, Lucy Law Lawless can also be seen as a punk rock chick being interviewed about Spider-Man later on in the movie. Lawless is of course most famous for her role as Xena Warrior Princess, a character that Spider-Man director Sam Raimi would reference directly in his most recent superhero film, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. There's actually a statue modeled after Xena at the Illuminati headquarters. Then Peter of course inevitably fights local wrestling legend Bonesaw McGraw, played by real life wrestling legend Randy Savage, but Peter would of course quickly use his spider powers to snap Bonesaw into a Slim Jim. And later, when Peter attempts to pick up his winnings for the fight, you can see that the office of the scumbag club managers who were scamming Peter out of his money were filled with pictures of barely clothed women, with a Perfect 10 calendar even appearing in the corner of this frame here. Perfect 10 actually used to be a well-known adult magazine company before the company went out of business in 2007. I'm guessing because one of these guys died. Because holy shit, were these guys probably their number one subscribers. But anyways, after those club managers that just scammed Peter get mad at Peter for not stopping a man with a gun out of the kindness of his own heart, Uncle Ben gets turned into Swiss cheese in a surprise twist that nobody who has read a Spider-Man comic saw coming. Uncle Ben dying? What? But definitely not as big of a surprise as everyone would get two sequels later in Spider-Man 3 when it was revealed that it wasn't Dennis Carradine that put holes in Benjamin, but a future Sandman flipped Marco instead. In the comics, however, Uncle Ben isn't actually killed on the street, but is actually killed in his own home after Ben accidentally startles an intruding burglar, which to be fair, was quite quite rude of Uncle Ben. I mean, if you're home alone, make some noise so the home invaders know where you are. I mean, that's just a neighborly thing to do. But anyways, what I found particularly sad about Ben's death in the movie is that when Ben opens his eyes for the last time, you can actually see the tears that he cried right before he lost consciousness. Like, it's super sad to think that he was just crying alone in the street. This then, of course, prompts Peter to chase after Dennis the Menace with the frosted tips, transitioning from real-life actor to a fully CG Spider-Man as he runs down this alleyway. And while swinging after a dentist driving crazy, Peter swings past the Roger Smith Hotel at 501 Lexington Avenue before landing on a truck for Carlsberg Beer. And later, after Peter watches the life leave Dennis's body with uncaring eyes, he goes home and hugs his aunt. And while he does, we can see that Sam Raimi purposely leaves this empty chair and frame to signify the absence of Uncle Ben and accentuate just how empty the house has now become. Moving on, the Green Goblin then, of course, goes to blow up Norman Osborn's competition, Quest Aerospace, who were pitching their Badger Dollar Tree Iron Man military exosuit for the American government. 
Quest Aerospace was actually a real company that produced model rocket kits before they were acquired by Marvel in 1995 who would own Quest Aerospace for eight years before selling it back in 2003. But anyways, later, when we get a montage of Peter's first outings at Spider-Man, the first newspaper with the headline, Masked Man Foils Robbery, actually has the text within the article repeat twice just to fill up space. And soon after this, we see a newspaper with the headline, Man Climbs Walls Like Spider, which features references to a woman named Heidi Fugman, who was actually one of the movie's producers, along with another woman named Jessica Flaherty, who worked on the staff. And then when we see that man singing the Spider-Man song in the subway, you can see that his guitar case has a spider power sticker on it, indicating that this dude was likely taking this one-man spider show on the road as one of Spidey's top fans. And shortly after this, we get a shot of Spider-Man looking over the city with the twin towers reflecting off of his eyes as a subtle nod to the 9-11 tragedy that was fresh on the minds of everyone in 2002. Then, before MJ runs into Peter on the street, we can see MJ leaving her job at the Moon Dance Diner, which is actually a real diner in Manhattan located at 88th 6th Avenue that has appeared a number of times in pop culture, with one of the more well-known instances being in the TV show Friends, with Monica having also been employed at the Moondance Diner herself. Who Monica is, I don't know. I don't watch Friends because I love myself. I'm just kidding. If you like Friends, it's totally fine. I'm just being stupid. Then, during the transition to the next scene, a flag on the side of a building has the words, the web string platform on it, which is ironic considering that the sides of all the buildings of New York are the platforms for all of Spider-Man's web strings. Then, when Norman and Peter confront Harry about his secret girlfriend, Harry can be seen wearing an Oscorp green colored shirt, which I believe was a purposeful design choice to both represent the Green Goblin serum as well as Harry Osborn's deep desire for his father to notice him because all his dad cares about is Oscorp. And speaking of shirts, when Peter heads to the Daily Bugle in the following scene, we can see Elizabeth Banks' Betty Brant wearing flowers on her shirt just like Aunt May and MJ tend to do. I mean, this makes sense considering that in the Spider-Man comics, Betty Brant has been one of the special women in Peter Parker's life. With Peter's attempt at flirtation with Betty in that scene being a nod to their history in the source material. And later, during the Unity Day Parade, an ad for the Lion King Broadway play can be seen in the wide shot before we get a performance from R&B singer Macy Gray singing My Nutmeg Fantasy from her 2001 album The Id. Then, as the Green Goblin attacks the crowd, we can see Stan the Man Lee grabbing a little girl to save her from falling rubble. This would be Stan Lee's second cameo in a Marvel movie after X-Men 1 in the year 2000. Then, as Spider Spider-Man is swinging through the city after saving MJ from falling at the Unity Festival, they swing past a Daily Bugle newspaper box with the headline, Subway Bandits Strike Again, Police Offer Token Response, which is of course a subway token pun, no doubt courtesy of Jameson's brilliant mind. And as Peter and MJ swing through the city, MJ is actually gazing lovingly at a lifeless Spider-Man dummy that she's hugging in front of a green screen, which is kind of hilarious. And later, when Norman goes to confront the goblin in front of the mirror, in his office, Goblin tells Norman to follow the cold shiver running down his spine in order to find him, which I found to be excellent symbolic writing considering that the Goblin is literally a cold shiver running down Norman's spine, as the Goblin serum itself appears to have implanted this new cold consciousness into Norman's nervous system. And when a Goblin hands Norman the newspaper about the Goblin's Unity Day attack on Times Square, the paper refers to the Goblin as a weird green freak from another world, which I I found to be retroactively amusing living in this post-Spider-Man No Way Home world where Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin literally becomes a weird green freak from another world. And man, do I truly love every time Willem Dafoe has these monologues between Norman and the Goblin because this dude is genuinely such a great actor who can portray two different identities so flawlessly. And one of my favorite missable details about this scene is how Sam Raimi deliberately had the Goblin reflection have a little bit of a loose hair on the right side of his forehead forehead, despite Norman Osborn himself not having that loose hair at all, firmly cementing the Goblin as a separate entity being projected by Norman's fractured mind onto the mirror, an entity that refers to themselves as Norman's greatest creation, which is deeply reflective of Norman Osborn's selfish and narcissistic nature. I mean, with Harry Osborn trying so hard to get his father to 
to notice him, having the goblin claiming himself to be Norman's greatest creation shows just how much Norman values the creations of his own ambitions over the living biological creation that he made. Like The goblin and Harry Osborn are both Norman Osborn's kids fighting for his focus and attention throughout this movie, and I love it. Then, right before Goblin bursts through the window of Jameis's office at the Daily Bugle, I notice that the suspenders that J.J. wears seems to hint at Jameson's liberal political leanings. That they are designed with political activism signs like save social security and cut tax. And later on, when the Daily Bugle eventually publishes a newspaper article about the Goblin's attack on the Daily Bugle, on the top right of the page, you can see an article about the harbor rising and scientists considering options. Also showing that Jameson has a bit of a passion for protecting the climate. But anyways, as the employees of the Daily Bugle freak out at the Goblin's arrival, you can see a Daily Bugle newspaper headline on the wall that says Gorby out and Boris in which is a reference to the fall of Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet Union and the rise of the nation of Russia under Boris Yeltsin. And as much as Jameson is a dick to everybody around him, the way that he actually protects Peter Parker by refusing to give him up to the Goblin shows how good Jameson actually is on the inside. Truly one of my favorite moments from this movie. Then later, when the Goblin has a face-to-face -face with a weakened Spider-Man, he proposes that they both team up to do bad things together as fellow super soldiers, which is very similar to what Deacon Frost proposed Post to Blade in 1998's Blade just four years prior. The Goblin then warns Peter that if they don't work together, then they'll just keep clashing over and over again until they're both dead, which is ironically exactly what would happen to Ultimate Spider-Man in 2011's Ultimate Spider-Man 160. And later, when Goblin surprises Spider-Man inside of a burning building after disguising themselves as an old lady, he asks Spider-Man if he's in or out in regards to his offer to team up, to which Spider-Man replies that it is the Goblin who is in fact out, which is exactly what the board of directors told Norman Osborn when they kicked him out of Oscorp, and exactly what subsequently got them vaporized into skeletons. So having Spider-Man say that specific phrase to the Goblin was a great callback to show just how much Norman and the Goblin just hate being said no to. And because the Goblin was disguised as an old lady, when Peter arrives to the Thanksgiving dinner late, he jokingly tells the group that he had to beat an old lady with a stick in order to get those cranberries, which is technically true in a way. The Green Goblin then goes to attack May Parker after figuring out Peter Parker was Spider-Man at dinner, forcing May to finish the Lord's Prayer from the book of Matthew chapter 6 in the Bible. And when May is at the hospital, Mary Jane brings her flowers, which may seem like just a regular thing for a person to do, but considering how this movie has themed both of these women after flowers, I found this gesture to have layered meaning here. Although one of the things in this movie that I never really understood was why Harry got so upset to see MJ holding Peter's hand at the hospital. I mean, Peter's aunt just got attacked and Peter needs emotional support. So why would Harry get so upset over that given those circumstances? Like, that seems kind of lame. But regardless, get upset he does, which leads him to emotionally confide in his crazy-ass dad, who finally gives him the fatherly affection that Harry has been craving in the form of a hug, causing Harry to cry at his father's embrace and acceptance. Then, when Peter talks to Aunt May when she wakes up in the hospital, we get another reference to DC Comics' Superman when Aunt May tells Peter that he does too much and to slow down because he's not Superman. Peter then goes to call Mary Jane to make sure that she's okay, but instead is greeted by the Goblin who asks if Spider-Man could come out to play, a question that the Green Goblin would repeat to all three Spider-Man at the Statue of Liberty in Spider-Man No Way Home. And later, when the Goblin attacks the Roosevelt Island tramway, check out how this dude can carry this entire tram car with just one arm. I mean, like, that is freaking insane, man. Like, the Goblin is truly one scary, strong-ass super soldier, like goddamn. Then, when the Goblin forces Spider-Man to choose between saving Mary Jane or saving that tram full of people, Spider-Man, of course, chooses to save both, which is a hallmark of a true Spider-Man, and why Miles Morales is currently trying to save his father and the entire Spider-Verse and beyond the Spider-Verse. And this all then leads us to the final showdown between Spider-Man and Green Goblin, a fight that is truly Sam Raimi at his absolute best, giving us a gruesome and dirty fight that literally ends with the villain being impaled in the freaking balls by his own goblin glider. A symbolic death considering just how much Norman Osborn ignored the sun that those very same impaled balls helped create 
the just reward for a father who chose his science creations over his biological creation. At Norman Osborn's funeral, Harry Osborn says, thank God for you, Peter, just like Norman Osborn did to Spider-Man right before he died, which I thought was a great way to show just how much alike both father and son were. And finally, right before the movie ends, Peter stares at Uncle Ben's grave, a grave that mysteriously has no birth or death year on it, which I found kind of funny, but hey, I get it. Tombstones are expensive. But that is it for this breakdown of Spider-Man 2002. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. You can follow me at Mastertainment on Instagram or Twitter or wherever I am on the internet. But most importantly, you can follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube because we always got some really fun stuff for you guys all the time and you don't want to miss anything. So be sure to hit that bell so you get notifications every time we upload a video. But anyways, you guys are amazing and spectacular. Thank you guys again for watching this video and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.